Hi, beautiful people. Today we have an episode that I get requested to like comment on all the time, which is astrology. And I have brought my favorite astrologer in the world to talk to all of you today. This is Eliza Kelly. She is a celebrity astrologer, columnist, author, and host referred to as a rising star in modern spirituality. Eliza has been featured in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Vogue, The Cut, and many other publications. She's the author of three books. Yes, Eliza, love it. <laughs> it's very awkward hearing you read this. <laughs> oh, I'm still going. It's still going. <laughs> Along with Will Arnett, Eliza was a producer and consulting astrologer behind Quibi's top performing show, Your Daily Horoscope. In addition, Lisa maintains her role as resident astrologer of Cosmopolitan Magazine, hosts a weekly astrology podcast entitled Stars Like Us, which I've been on before if you want to check out that episode. Um, and she manages a robust online community, the Constellation Club. Past and ongoing brand partnerships. <laughs> I <laughs> said no! <laughs> no more! No more! <laughs> I'm exhausted just hearing that list. I'm exhausted because it makes me feel like I have so much work to do. I'm like, am I doing nothing in this place? <laughs> but you know what? It was worth reading all of that because I brought the big guns. Y'all wanted to hear from an astrologer, like those are some credentials. Um, <laughs> and Aliza, obviously you know that this can be a triggering or complicated subject for a lot of us uh, Christians, ex-evangelicals as we're called, just people on their spiritual journey. So we are not, out of respect for Aliza, going to go too heavily into justifying why she's not going to hell or why she's valid in what she practices and believes. We're just going to honor and respect her and just have a conversation between two dear friends, because this is a genuine friend of mine, and just ask questions and lean into our curiosity in lieu, in lieu of demonizing, you know, the whole practice of it. So that's going to be the mode for today. Hello, Lisa. Hello. I, I'm so... I, I'm I'm so grateful to that we're not going to go to hell on this episode. Um, I you know I didn't grow up in a household that really practiced any religion. It was a very secular environment, but it especially there was no hell. There was definitely no hell. There was no devil. I feel very grateful for that because I feel like it has definitely allowed me to explore different aspects of my personality and my interests without thinking about going to hell in like a real legitimate fear-based way. But when I have heard at different points, you know, every so often someone will tell me that I am going to hell. This started when I was like 10. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they don't say it in a way that makes it seem like it's a fabulous place to be. So I'm really glad that that's not going to be what we talk about on this show. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, I really, I'm leaning into exploration this year and I, I don't need you to be sitting here justifying your existence to everybody. This is Thank just, you. Just, can yeah, I me. really, I can't, I can't do anything about the existence that was just <laughs> written in the stars. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, an interesting part of my backstory and a part of Eliza's fascination with yours truly is my family history. Um, in short, my grandmother in World War I was um, escaping the wrath of the war, basically. And in doing so, her mother had taught her and her sisters how to cast spells, how to read fortunes, and how to use a crystal ball kind of all as a means to sit in this female empowerment and this intuition and really use their energy to stave off any evil that was coming their way. And evil in wartime is no joke. Her father, my great-grandfather, was actually killed um, because he refused to make bread at his bread factory for the soldiers at the time. So apparently I come from a history of rebels and psychics and that and I would, I would argue witches. Yeah, there you go. 
And that is something that has been difficult for me to reckon with because my grandmother who we're discussing is the mother of my father. And my father was very scared of, of the way she practiced that. And he felt that she utilized both like dark energy and light energy to, I don't know. He has, he has his own opinions about what happened. I have my own thoughts about what that means and what happened. But um, point being, could you describe for us how you think of um, energy invitation, does astrology have anything to do with tapping into witchcraft or spirits? How are you actually practicing what you're doing? So it depends on the practitioner. Um, there are some practitioners who are strictly technical. And what I mean by that is that astrology can really look a lot like a math or a science practice in that it's really just measuring the planetary bodies. Um, and then what the correspondence is, uh, the personalities, I suppose you can say, that are assigned to those planets and zodiac signs are so ancient that you can sort of remove a lot of the spirituality and the magic um, from it completely. And there are astrologers who have totally, you know, I would say very secular practices that are just, you know, calculate somebody's birth chart in these mathematical terms and sort of describe what those planets in those zodiac signs are doing by the books. That is not how I practice. My practice is weaved into a constellation of other practices, um, including tarot, including my own psychic abilities, including spell work and manifestation. Um, and all of it is really extensions of my own creativity and my own artistic practices. Um, I was I've always been an artist, um, but I think I've always been afraid to be an artist. And I also don't think I had, uh, I knew what my, the right tools were for me. I studied painting in college and I love painting and I love drawing and I love making things with my hands. But I found over the past several years that making things through astrology, storytelling through astrology, writing through astrology, and then all of the other extensions of my practice is really, um, it, it's an incredibly regenerative tool set because I'm learning about myself through it. I'm telling stories with other people. So I'm also collaborating. Um, I'm always learning something new. So there's an academic aspect to it. Um, but there's also a very deeply spiritual aspect of it for me. And when I was younger, I think I, if we talked about this when I was younger and maybe I did say, maybe I lean more into the technical side because it was less vulnerable. You know, I don't have to lead with like me and my humanity and my soul and my journey and, you know, my relationship with the universe. If I'm just looking at a planet moving through a Zodiac sign, but the truth is as I've gotten older and as I have become more comfortable um, being who I am, feeling the way I do about the world, knowing, you know, how I can work with people, how I can work with myself, how I, how this has been really, it's an incredible tool to change lives. It has changed my life. So being on the other side of my Saturn return has sort of empowered me to, to really describe myself as more of a creator and more as an artist who then employs these tools um, as a way of being able to express my identity. Mm, beautiful. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I think I'd like to ask you about, um, and this I'm sure is not the right terminology, but like the selfish aspect of astrology where someone is like, I want to learn about this because I need to know if me and Brad are going to be together for the rest of our lives, or, you know, I want to know if I'm going to get this job or whatever. Like how much can someone be reliant on getting an app on their phone on astrology or talking to, you know, any astrologer in general and just figuring out what the stars say about their future? 
Well, that's interesting. I mean, I definitely would not put app and astrologer in the same category because it's <laughs> totally different experiences. Um, and I would definitely put a lot less stock in the app than I would the astrologer. But the fortune telling aspect of it is curious. It's curious to me too, because I am not a prophet <laughs> and I definitely have never seen a burning bush or have had any experiences where I feel equipped to be able to foretell future events that have not occurred. Uh, I don't, that, that's not even, I don't even have an interest in doing that, but I am very good at pattern recognition. And I have always been very good at pattern recognition. Um, I really like Tetris. And in a lot of ways, I think that is what the fortune telling aspect of astrology is, is seeing, knowing that these planets make patterns, knowing they each have an orbit and that orbit is assigned to a specific duration of time elapsing. And if we know that in the same way that if you're looking at a regular clock and you, you know, know that it's 5 p.m. and you're like, oh, the sun is going to start setting soon. That's not fortune telling. That's just pattern recognition of time. Mm. This is basically that on a macro level. Instead of just looking at the sun and moon, which we do look at in astrology, we're also looking at the other celestial bodies and saying, okay, Jupiter takes 12 years to do this orbit. The last time Jupiter was in this position was 2009. How can what happened in 2009 inform where we are today and what could happen now that Jupiter is back in that same position? So to me, it's not fortune telling as much as it's helping somebody sort of create more comprehensive and rigorous patterns and understand where things are going. And then also understand, of course, their choices and free will and, uh, you know, to align sort of just the natural flow of life with what somebody wants and what um, they want to either continue and amplify or begin or they want to cease and stop and transition away from. Um, I really believe in the in people's ability to change. And I don't think I could do this work if I didn't think that people have the ability to transform their life and to be agents of their own destiny. So for me and the work that I do, I really just, you know, it's, it's focused on empowering people to know what their options are and to know that at any given moment, there are, you know, infinite possibilities for decisions that could be made. That sounds a little stressful, <laughs> but I know what you all of a sudden I was like, no, not infinite decisions. Infinite, infinite. But it's true. I mean, every single day, I, I you know, that's like a, a scientific study. You make X number of decisions a day. And I think it's in the thousands or tens of thousands. It's something crazy. Um, what does this look like in layman's terms? Like how does somebody, you know, your average Joe on planet Earth, wrap their head around this idea or notion or fact that we have anything to do with the cosmos or that this pattern recognition can be noticed by the planetary whatever movements. I don't have any of the language that I need. No, to it's this. fine. I mean, and also <laughs> like an average Joe, I'm not going to talk to an average Joe who's not interested in astrology about astrology because in the same breath that I know that astrology has changed my life and I know that my work has changed my life. And I also am very, very fortunate to know that my work has also changed other people's lives, which is the most incredible gift to know, to have that information. Um, yeah, and just to clarify, I'm not asking you to justify anything. I think I'm just more curious of like, how do we actually grasp the truth of that or understand how what you are saying is in relation to the cosmos which relates to us here on planet earth well that's the very thing is that i don't know how it works yeah <laughs> um i don't know i don't know why it works and i think that it works because there are just these very organic patterns that we have as natural beings um, as nature ourselves. 
And just as nature works in cycles, we as humans of nature, as nature work in cycles, and we were the ones who assigned the roles to the planets. I mean, it's all man-made. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> that's the, the big reveal of it all is that this is all architected to fit our humanity. Mm. But I think that the magic is in the humanity of it. I think that the magic is in the ability to see yourself mirrored in the cosmos and to see the scope of your life as so much larger and so much vaster than any singular moment could offer. And I think that knowing the expanse that is a single person and is the, the possibilities and the opportunities is really um, an invitation to, to be alive and to like make the most out of your life and to enjoy it. So that's, I would say, practically how it works because how the planets would possibly, you know, how, why would Saturn know that it is the planet associated with rules? I don't, wouldn't imagine it does, you know, I wouldn't imagine that Pluto knows that it's the planet of transformation. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but if it works and if those patterns can fold so organically and naturally into our own stories, then that's all we need to know. Yeah. And I wonder if anyone can just like relate to my personal story and I'll tell you, which is, like I said, I began with this um, really ingrained uh, theology or ideology that this was all wrong. This is all sin. This is all not of God, but demonology, whatever, all of these uh, trigger terms to make me very afraid of the concept of astrology. And then I think dipping my toe in just came when I was meeting really vibrant, interesting people who were giving me really compelling arguments. The argument being just like, well, here is your chart and here is what it tells me. And me being unable to deny the truth that I received from that. And then even the information that's gleaned from that, um, from the person, it was just like, okay, well, I can keep denying that this is real. I can keep being afraid of it, but this is something that's presenting itself. And um, I think I remember maybe this is like a decade ago or more when I was just, learning or remembering that we're made up of so much water in our bodies and that the moon takes in the tide and brings it back out again. And I was thinking, well, of course, we're all connected to nature and earth and the planets in this way, because if I am full of water and the moon is in control of water on earth, like how could we not all be intertwined? Now on my journey of like, being a Christian, which in so many ways is just confining by nature, you're all of a sudden supposed to be like, well, this is X and this is Y and this is how it works. And you're not even allowed to peek out and consider anything else. Um, so I just wanted to share that to be like, does that have any resonance with you or your practice when you think about the moon and the tides and how it affects our bodies and our being? Yeah, I mean, the moon, I, when I was younger and I was first starting to infuse astrology into my life, both personally and professionally, um, that was like my default, was explaining the significance of the moon and the fact that our bodies are majority water. And if we know that the moon responds or water responds to the moon, then how could our bodies not respond to the lunations? I mean, period. Like that is a hundred percent. There's a lot of compelling arguments for the luminaries, the sun and the moon as to how we as natural beings, as organic matter are going to be reacting to this just as the plants do, just as the water does. Um, but then when you get into like the other planets, when you get into Mercury or Venus, it's harder because you don't have as much tangible evidence. And a lot of astrology, unfortunately, is the things that we don't have as much tangible evidence for. <laughs> yeah. So I have found myself sort of distancing myself from even mentioning how relevant the moon is on our, phys on our physiology, because it's one of many planets in astrology that we talk about, but certainly it begs a very, very compelling argument for why the celestial bodies are going to be influencing us. And I think that, I mean, there's no, if you just tune in ever so slightly to the difference between 
the new moon and the full moon, you can feel it on a physical level. Um, it's the other ones that are more abstract and a little more challenging, I think, to for someone who is like, well, what is a planet in the sky millions of light years away from me have anything to do with me? Those are the ones that are, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I yeah. don't know what it does, <laughs> but I know how through thousands of conversations I've had over the years, what I've seen, you know, mm. I know what stories I've heard and I know how it's really shown up in people's lives. And I know what wisdom I have been able to glean through just talking with so many thousands of people. But I think to your point, you know, I think we as humans, we as humans find ourselves very compelled to argue for things and justify things and evangelize. And early on, I made the decision to not ever evangelize anyone mm -hmm. and to not, and that's why it's kind of, you know, I, I'm, it's been great for my own energetic boundaries, but I think I have disappointed a lot of people who had wanted to have like very heated arguments with me at dinner parties about me at my work as an astrologer because as soon as somebody is like well how does it work and i start to sense that they want me to try to convince them i bow out because i have no interest in making this work for someone who it doesn't work for you know if this works for you and if it is a tool that enhances your life and makes things better then you use it. If it's a tool that causes you more stress and anxiety, and then you find yourself obsessing over the planets and the signs and your chart and your crushes chart, like maybe it's not the right tool for you. And that's okay. It's mm. just not for everyone. I love that you say that. I really, really do. First of all, dope boundaries. I commend you <laughs> a million percent. I love like Nothing sexier than a person with boundaries. I can imagine, <laughs> I want to witness a dinner party like that and be like, mm, yes, Eliza. <laughs> but I also, I love that that grace and that space you're giving to say, remember to check in with yourself. Remember to notice whether or not this is working for you. Because I think a huge part of my resistance to tarot cards, which is interesting because a lot of people I know in the deconstructed Christian space use tarot and my greatest thing has just been like my over explanation for everything and wanting to latch on to something especially I'm in a moment of like desperation of needing a relationship to work out or wanting a job or all these I'll always I would I think turn to something like that as a resource in a time where it would just cause me great anxiety so I really appreciate that you are saying this may not work if it causes you more anxiety than joy and peace, then this is not the right practice for you. Well, one of the reasons that I actually created, I have so many barriers to entry before someone can book a session with me is because I don't work with people who are in desperate states of mind. Wow. Um, Good for you. As, yeah. yeah, because it's not, because astrology, tarot, magic, manifestation is not going to help when you're in that kind of frame of mind, you know, um, when you're desperately clinging to any answer that you can get. Um, that's not, I don't want to work in that space because that's an energy that is too chaotic. It's too frenetic and it's not, you know, you need to be grounded in order for this work to be able to resonate and to do its magic. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, other better services, better practitioners, therapists, you know, that <laughs> can help in those moments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's really cool. I like that a lot. Um, could you explain some things that people are very familiar with in society that I'm sure are gravely misunderstood and we can start with mercury and retrograde? <laughs> Well, first of all, it's not Mercury in retrograde. It's Mercury <laughs> retrograde. Great. Mercury. <laughs> yes. So there it is. There's the first one. Um, Mercury retrograde is a optical illusion, um, which happens three to four times a year. Um, and during this optical illusion, Mercury appears to be moving backwards, Mercury retrograde, Mercury backwards. Um, 
And Mercury is the planet of communication and it is associated with all things technology and language and basically what our entire culture is structured around. Um, so naturally when Mercury is moving backwards or appears to be moving backwards, it would also appear that our technology is breaking down that we're getting like we're signing shitty contracts that we are in these bad conversations with people who don't get us and the optical illusion factor is critical because it's not that things are fucked it's that they appear to be fucked but sometimes when something <laughs> appears to be fucked it's just as bad as if it is mm. um so yeah during mercury retrograde one does have to be like extra careful and sensitive about you know, who they're emailing. We often will hear from exes during that time because things are going backwards. So things we're getting nostalgic. We want to reach out and go into our past. Um, we must resist the urge because often then we end up regretting it when Mercury is normal again. And we're like, I want to actually move forward with my life and not go in this opposite direction. However, Mercury retrograde has become a fabulous branding promotional opportunity for a lot of companies that have nothing to do with astrology, um, that love to lean into these astrological lingos, et cetera. And I think something that has happened over the years progressively is that people think that their whole lives are falling apart during Mercury retrograde. But the truth is, is that Mercury does not as a planet have enough power to ruin an entire life. You know, it could, make you slip up in who you're emailing or who you're texting, but it's not going to create like an entire infrastructural collapse. So if that is happening, there's probably something else going on in your life that's <laughs> not Mercury related. So now we're talking about therapy again. <laughs> <laughs> or we're talking about Saturn return. We're talking about a bigger transit, something larger that's happening that has more you know, from an astrological perspective that is going to pack a little more punch, but Mercury retrograde is not, it does not have enough bandwidth to be able to transform someone's life like that. It sounds, it sounds kind of cute. It reminds me of those memes it's that cute. are like, not today, Satan. It's like, nice try. It's totally, it's totally <laughs> that. It's totally that. <laughs> that's, that's really cute if I think about it that way. And perfect transition, because I was going to say the second one, obviously, people hear about all the time is Saturn return. Can we get into that? Yeah, Saturn return is no joke. I mean, that one actually lives up to the hype. It is a very, very important celestial milestone that occurs in your late 20s between the ages of like 28 and a half and 30. Mm -hmm. And it's when Saturn, who is the planet that's associated with the rules and responsibilities makes a complete orbit around your birth chart. So when Saturn returns to its position that it occupied at the time you were born, in the eyes of astrology, you are really becoming your own adult. You're becoming a fully realized mature person which means that you have to sort of be your own parent so depending on somebody's life this could be either a time of a lot of catharsis where they're like oh my life has been so hard i've had to self-parent since i was so young like finally i'm equipped and i have the tools to do it and i'm no longer going to look to like my irresponsible parents to help usher me through things i already know or if someone's life has been super easy and they've never had to pick up a tool in their entire life, suddenly it's like, here, you have to learn how to use a power drill. And they're like, I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. Like, <laughs> I always just have my parents do this for me. And then that's like an existential crisis. Either way, it is an impactful time where there's definitely a before and after for everyone. Um, but it's going to signal different things based on your unique conditions, your unique life, and what, you know, has happened prior to that time. Mm. I mean, all rings true for me. I definitely had a major reckoning at exactly that moment. And I feel like I land somewhere in between, like moving to LA at 19, being very independent, and not having, I don't know, being parented very well, but still desperately needing to become the adult that I hope I am now. Um, yeah. Yeah. And how, okay. So would you tell us about like what kind of season we're in now, for example? Well, we are at the 
very end of Pisces season right now, um, which is a very odd time um, seasonally, astrologically. You know, we in here in New York where I am are definitely feeling the oddness of it because we'll have like a beautiful 60 degree day and then we'll have snow uh, a few hours later, you know? So it's in this, we're in a threshold. We're in a transition before the spring equinox, before the vernal equinox and the new astrological cycle will begin on March 21st, 2021 of this year. Um, so in astrology, the new year really begins at, in, at the end of March. So at the time that we're recording this right now in mid-March, we're kind of wrapping things up. We're in this sort of dreamy, transitional, thresholdy state um, where we're really, a lot of us have, are having like heavy subconscious activity, big dreams, big emotions, big energy, also might be feelings just sort of this like, what is next? Like, I am so stuck. It's also been a Can't year imagine of COVID. Why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which from an astrological perspective also tracks. I mean, it's not like astrology has disregarded things like COVID. They just Im are embedded into our storytelling and into the planets. Um, but always at this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere, when we are sort of starting to wake up from winter, there's a lot of snow and oddness and sort of ethereal magic that gets shaken off as well. Mm. How did COVID fit into all of this? Because I know so many people that had such different experiences, but I also, I mean, I feel we had such a profound awakening. Like everyone kept saying like 2020 vision. That was kind of like the cheesy church thing that I was hearing, but between this George Floyd wave of BLM, which was so enormous it's in its power, um, even though we've had so many renditions of it before and we've tried to like upstart this movement, it felt like, whoa, this is a true reckoning. And um, different kinds of things, even watching the Woody Allen documentary last night, I was like, that has needed to be uncovered for freaking decades and decades and decades. And now his daughter's truth is finally out and being heard and being validated. So to me, that seemed like the theme of the year. Does that clock? And if so, how so? Or, or you know, was 2020 meant to be kind of this thematic thing that occurred? It was. I mean, and I... I I'm not alone in having done a lot of late 2019 interviews on how crazy 2020 was going to be. And then of course, having that uh, oh, really? unfortunate validation. Like, I foretold it. Yeah. Can you tell uh, me like what you were, what were you kind of saying or sensing or feeling or any Well, of the that? astrology of 2020 was extraordinary, extraordinary in how rare it is. Um, how profound it is and how many different profound and rare astrological unions were happening uh, in a 12 month duration was very abnormal. Mm. Actually, the last time that we had seen astrology that looked like 2020 astrology was in the 1500s um, with the Protestant Reformation. No, so, oh my God, you just gave me chills. Yeah, that was, so that's what I was saying um, leading up to 2020. What was that going to look like was anyone's guess. Um, there were some astrologers who now have kind of gone back and been like, well, of course it was a pandemic because there were these cycles and it needed to look like this. Um, I am not going to say that I foretold a pandemic by any means, but I also described in 2019, 2020 as a pressure cooker with the top popping off. Mm. Um, and I do think that that checks out yeah. uh, even you know, across different domains. You know, the, there was a lot that was being sort of consolidated in that 2020 year, including you know, this is the recognition of this systemic racism in the United States, but there's multiple different planets doing multiple different things um, all at the same time, you know? So it's not that 
there is necessarily a deep connection between COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement that we saw at the end of spring, early summer, but they also do coexist in the same year. So there is a relationship between them. Um, they're also, you know, that story uh, of COVID is a different story and has a different story arc than the story that we're going to be telling about, you know, exposing perverts, <laughs> you know, that's a different story arc than also exposing racists. And it's a different story arc than or all the of the care system or exactly or, or yeah, or like, yeah, the pharmaceutical companies and opioids and like all of these things in astrology have attributions. It just so happened that in 2020, a lot of them were getting activated at the same time. What a trip. Yeah, what? it was. Yeah. So I'm excited to continue to see this unearthing of the truth, you know? <laughs> and that is what is happening, at least in the United States, what we are gonna continue to explore leading up to and in increasing actually over the next couple of years. Um, with the United States having its first ever Pluto return, which takes 248 years to do a full rotation. And it just so happens to be happening in our lifetime, you know, just a few years in 2022. Uh -oh. So just a few years after 2020. <laughs> so that is like, how do you also account for that? You know, that like you have all of these cycles beginning and ending all in about the same time period in the same five years you know it's really extraordinary to be alive right now wow um okay i have two huge thoughts that i can't wait to hear you answer one is the reason i got full body chills when you talked about the protestant reformation is because there is a gigantic reckoning happening in the church and when oh. i Oh my gosh, girl. I, um, when I started God is Gray, it was a very independent thing for me. I felt like I'm just one girl telling her story. And this is important because the church hurt me in these profound ways. And I didn't know anything about colonization. I didn't have the words for like rape culture or enthusiastic consent. Like all of these things were so just not in my awareness because I was just a girl on my own figuring this stuff out and just trying to process my embodiment the way that I hadn't lived embodied as a Christian evangelical because I was told my flesh is evil, my spirit is good. So I was compartmentalizing pieces of myself. This was just meant to be for me, my journey of putting those pieces back together and sharing that with others. But holy moly, I had a vision when I very first started God is Gray, right before I uploaded the very first video, God, whatever word you would like to ascribe to that, um, showed me this like square field that was completely black, blank out, just like me in this field. I stepped out of this dense forest and I was standing there by myself, like fully exposed out on my own, scared a little bit, nervous. And then I saw a woman waving at me from the distance and I waved at her. And then all of a sudden, all these people began coming out of the bushes and joining me in this field of exposure, of sunlight, of all of these beautiful things. And I knew that divinity was telling me, when you do this, you're going to find you're not alone. You're going to see wow. people everywhere step out and begin to share their stories. So 2020 has been insane to me because it's church abuse, scandals. Now that we have the power of the internet, I have the power and everyone else in my deconstruction circle has the power to be like, look at what that pastor did. Look at what's happening over here. This girl got raped over here. No one's talking about it. All of us are like upheaval. What's up? This is true. This is what's happening and we're exposing it. So when you say the Protestant Reformation, progressive Christian is a brand new term that I, I mean, and it has roots. It's been like burgeoning and blossoming for a long time, just like all of these other things, BLM and women's rights and all of these things we've been battling for, for so long, but now we like have a name to it. It has like a structured kind of like 
feeling to it for the very first time in my lifetime for sure and I kept saying that I was like this is like any revival before this is like the Protestant Reformation is what wow. I've been telling friends so then when you wow. said that I just got chills all over my body wow it's so interesting to hear you say that and speak to that from a it's so interesting to hear you speak to that from an actual from from the words of an actual christian because obviously i mean i am observing change and restructuring and truth telling veracity which has become like my favorite word mm -hmm. um through different lenses from what i'm exposed to but one of the reasons that i always really make a point to say uh when I'm teaching astrology, you know, that astrologers aren't prophets is because astro for many reasons, but one of them is because astrologers are only, anyone is only as ever limited to their perspective, you know, to what they know and to who they know. And I don't know anyone who you're the, really the only Christian I know, like active Christian, you know? So I didn't know that there was this cataclysmic rupture that was happening in the community make sense from an astrological perspective, but wouldn't have known it without you telling me. Mm. And it's interesting that that checks out in your community too, because it certainly checks out in some of the other communities that I have been talking to and have been talking to me as well. Beautiful. Blowing my mind. That's amazing. Amazing. Okay, and then the second thing that came up for me is that I was really stunned and incredibly curious about the worldwide nature of the pandemic, because I was like, at what time in history have we been this interconnected um, physically by sharing with the same trauma, with the same reckoning, with the same, you know, pandemic that we're all dealing with, that it it involved every single person on this planet, every single country, every single city. It was just mind blowing to me. And then paired with this idea that we are also communicate, like we can communicate with each other. We're connected in that way as well because of the internet. So all of that, I was just like, this is such a time in history. I recognize that I'm living in something very, very special and unique and I'm just curious, again, astrologically, if that checks out about it being a worldwide thing and that we would all have this, this thing in common with each other. So yeah, and that it, it does, and it speaks to those big outer planets, you know, the non-Mercury planets, the ones that are further and that take up more solar system real estate in their orbits, you know, planets like Saturn that has a 30 year cycle or Uranus that has an 84 year cycle or Neptune with 144, Pluto 248 years, you know, when those planets do things, they are generational things that are experienced over larger amounts of time. And they're called transpersonal planets because they are not just specific to an individual they are shared experiences among many individuals, among generations. So those planets are doing very, that was what was happening in 2020, is that those outer planets were making these very rare connections with each other, which were indicating big societal transpersonal changes, you know, things that are not just in, on an individual level. From an astrological perspective, however, the co you know covid is no different than anything else in somebody's chart and what i mean by that is that you know we could have a sort of a more micro example of this is before the last job that i had before i became a full-time astrologer i was laid off because the whole company closed it was this like weird corporate company in New York City and 400 people lost their jobs. I was sort of straddling, um, be, you know, feeling like, am I prepared to take this plunge? Am I financially secure enough? Is this going to be a responsible decision? And the universe made that decision for me. 
when I talked to my astrologer, she was like, great. Yeah. You got fired so that you could become an astrologer. And I was like, well, like 390 people also got fired, not so that I could become an astrologer. (laughs) And she was like, no, they all also had to do something else, you know? And in that way, it's like, yes, everyone is being affected by this pandemic in the world in their own individual way. You know, we all can share the fact that this is sort of the common denominator, but what that means for an individual and how that needed to change their life and what that change necessitated and why that change was there is going to be on a case by case basis for everyone in the world. So from an astrological perspective, it's like, I can see in people's charts that, you know, something happened in 2020, but it is no different than if there was a mass layoff, you know, which there was also. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much exactly that. Um, I'm just thinking too of like, uh, Christians really struggle with this notion of why do bad things happen to good people? And my rebuttal isn't the right word, but my my thought towards that is that life to me is this grand adventure. And to me, the purpose of it is to continue to elevate yourself, to continue to reside in your own self and, and, and like come at other people with love and grace and, and give space to that, hold your own boundaries. Like there's so many different things you learn in this lifetime that are to me meant to be edifying, give you a beautiful life and help you give that goodness and that love to other people. That to me is the purpose. And then when something quote bad happens, whatever it may be, and Lord knows there's real traumas in this world. There are really terrible things that can happen to a person, but I don't see that as like God causing something to happen to somebody. It's more to me, just like this, place is chaos and we're all just bouncing it off of each other and all of our childhood traumas and all of our experiences etc so my question is again from an astrological point of view what do you think or say of that notion of why do bad things happen to good people and the reason it brought or i came to that question is because you're talking about like well did 499 people have to get laid off so i could be an astrologist a lot of Christians, I think, will walk around with that, like, and no shade to anybody. This is just the way we grew up, where it's like, well, I mean, terrible things. Like, oh, well, your child had to die so that your husband would come to the Lord. And it's like, oh, Lord, I know. Oh, that's no, what I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, that's think, thing. I watch a lot of nature documentaries, like obsessive amounts of nature documentaries. It is basically the only thing that I do at night, like sun goes down and I turn on nature, literally the PBS show. Um, And what I learn from those nature documentaries that I watch obsessively is that nature is really cruel. Mm. Um, And it is cruel through the eyes of a human, you know? Um, I can't watch, like when wolves killed the baby wolves and different packs, like it is painful to watch things like that. And I don't often, I skip it because I don't want to have bad dreams. You know, I don't want it to get into my psyche, but the truth is, is that that happens. The truth is, is that like nature is more powerful than we as humans can understand and fathom. And that includes like cruel things happening that we can't understand uh, why they happen and why they seem so harsh and mean and terrible. And it's also, that's that, you know, we don't have answers. Mm. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was thinking someone gave this beautiful quote, and I thought about it with the ocean of just nature being cruel, but indifferent. Yes, exactly. Comes, oh my gosh, we perceive that to be cruel, but it is just nature being indifferent doing what it does totally and i think about that often because sometimes when i'm watching these you know these sad moments in the nature documentaries if i just mute it and i take out the drama of the music and the narration 
I can tolerate just seeing these things, but when the human impression of like, this is a sad scene, this is a horrible scene comes in, it obviously influences my perception of it. But if I just mute it and neutralize it, it's much more tolerable because I'm not, you know, the human impression and perspective isn't influencing my understanding of it. And I can just sort of sit with it. Um, sitting with discomfort is something that I have been thinking about a lot um, as a white woman really wanting to learn how to do anti-racism work, sitting with the discomfort of the things that are hard for me to talk about, sitting with the discomfort of hearing things that are hard to hear, um, and allowing myself and, and sort of building up more of a tolerance for for putting myself in uncomfortable situations. And that includes, you know, kind of to fold it in like horrible things that happen because they do happen. And we can't just pretend like they don't, you know, really bad things happen to people. And sometimes those things can be avoided. A lot of the time those things can be avoided by becoming aware of them and calling them out and bringing light to them in the first place. But you have to first be able to tolerate recognizing that horrible things happen uh, in order to be able to do the work to stop them from happening. And I'm talking human to human stuff. I'm not talking about tidal waves, you know, um, humans doing bad things to people. I feel like this all beautifully ties into what you're talking about with astrology, because I would imagine if you're in the practice of it, because like you said, it can be a purely scientific approach or you can add a spiritual approach to it and that you work from both of those lenses obviously i will always move with spirituality too that's just the person that i am at my core but is that what you find makes astrology really potent and powerful in people's lives that they're able to sort of like take the emotional I don't know, experience out of everything and actually be able to like look at it in a more scientific minded way? Yeah, I think that like astrology kind of is like having a third party, you know, it, it, it makes things more objective um, and it allows people to be more objective about their life and what's happened to them. Mm ironically because it's also a deeply emotional and we go into like traumas and we talk about the most painful things that have happened to one's soul you know but astrology is kind of like a middleman you know it's kind of like it's not me it's the stars and that allows us to be able to empty out our pockets and sort of throw everything out on the table and talk and have real honest conversations about life and parents and society and what you want and what you desire and what you're interested in having and all of those things without the shame and the ridicule and the embarrassment of whatever those things are which i think hinder a lot of people but if we were to objectively say like your father looks controlling and i can see that from the position of saturn in your chart then we can have a conversation about your dad, not about him being good or bad, but just about the fact that he's controlling objectively, you know? Yeah. And it's easier for us to be able to then talk about, you know, where do you identify yourself as separate from that? And where does your individuality and your autonomy and your choice come into that equation in recognizing that everyone who has ever interacted with us and especially anyone who's ever raised us is multidimensional, um, is not good or bad, is just a person who did things that affect us, you know? Mm. Brilliant, I love it. <laughs> really beautifully put. Thank you so much to anyone who's made it to the end of this conversation. Um, I'm sorry that it's gotten like so dark and eerie. Or it's, I, you know, oh, sunset. scary. <laughs> I don't want to scare anyone away in the thumbnail. <laughs> we'll give a bright picture of you. Aliza. Great. Not scary, yeah. <laughs> no, not scary. A little scary, but not that scary. <laughs> um, 
Yes, but um, I'm just grateful for you being here because I think I get asked the astrology question probably more than anything else. It's such a point of curiosity and it's so, you know, and in, in, in everyone's consciousness because like you said, corporations do kind of pick up these things like Merc Mercury in retrograde, like what's up? And then it's worth unpacking it with a real life professional. So thank you. So the much. last thing that I'll say for anyone who is feeling, you know, who feels intimidated by astrology, whether it be for religious or spiritual or simply technical reasons, because it's a lot, is that the universe will only ever give you what you can understand at any given moment, you know? So the Bible if, says the same thing. Really? Well, mm -hmm. I love when I am aligned with the Bible. I love when I align with Jesus. I love Jesus. I think he's so cool. Like love when these sort of universal truths coexist because they are greater than any doctrine, you know, they are just sort of beautiful wisdoms. So if astrology feels overwhelming for somebody, you don't need to read your horoscope. You know, if you're interested in dabbling, dabble. And then if it feels scary, back off. There's nobody needs to do anything. Everything is a choice. So take what feels good. And then if something doesn't work, you know, adjust to your needs. Love it. Thank you again for giving everyone that grace and that permission to not pressure themselves. That's no awesome. pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But for the love of God, don't judge others. I think that is, that's my last move or thing that I want to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I can stand that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where can everyone find you? Well, I'm on the internet, uh, believe it or not. And <laughs> you can find me at Aliza Kelly, A-L-I-Z-A, everywhere. At Aliza Kelly is the place to go. Perfect. All right. We love you all so much. God bless. Thank you.